see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm here with Sam Backnin. And uh, Sam is a diagnosed psychopathic narcissist and an expert on narcissism. And we're going to be talking about uh, how we can build a culture of empathy. So thank you very much, Sam, for joining me. Thank you for having me. Um, would you like to introduce yourself a bit more? You know, talk a little bit, just a uh, bit more about yourself and your background. Well, I have different hats. I'm an economic advisor to governments. I'm editor-in-chief of Global Politician and so on and so forth. But I think what's relevant to this program is uh, the fact that, as you have as you've said, I've been twice diagnosed with uh, malignant narcissism, pathological narcissism, and that I've authored a series of books and e-books about personality disorders, the most notorious of which is uh, Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. Okay, so what you know, what I'm really working on is uh, through the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy is exactly what the title is of our of our uh, organization is how we can increase the uh, level of of empathy within society and you know the uh, narcissists and the psychopathy are kind of conditions that are known for kind of a lack of empathy. Mm -hmm. And you've, uh, you know, you've, you've been exploring the, the topic of empathy. You've, you've written about it and have a web page. And um, how, how would you, you know, to start with, how do you uh, personally define empathy? Well, there's a, a serious debate still ongoing. Started 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, and still ongoing strong. Whether empathy is a learned, learned thing, whether it can be inculcated, can be acquired, or whether it is innate, in, inborn. We know that uh, infants, and even infants, let alone children, display empathy in a variety of settings. Um, so that would seem to indicate that people are born with empathy. On the other hand, we know that full-fledged empathy, which I will discuss in a minute, is uh, a, a, an integral part of the social process of socialization. In other words, it is acquired. So there seems to be there seem to be arguments um, in favor of this version or that version. Empathy has two components. The first component is what I call cold empathy. It is known in philosophy as intersubjectivity. In other words, the ability to identify uh, moods, emotions, feelings, affects. Um, in other people. This component, the intersubjective component, is utterly cold in the sense that it has no emotional complement. It, it, it's, it's merely the process of identification, merely, merely the process of labeling uh, what we see, classifying it, a taxonomy. This is the first uh, element. The problem with the intersubjective element, or called empathy, is that when we, when we watch someone and we say, this guy is sad, or this, this woman is, is happy, we cannot be sure at all that what we label as sad, that, that sadness as we perceive it and as we had experienced it introspectively, is the same emotion that the other person is experiencing. So the problem with the intersubjective agreement is that we are using unclear, ambiguous, arguable terminology. We cannot agree on a common dictionary because we have no access to the mind, psyche, and soul of other people. We have access only to ourselves, known as introspection. Mm -hmm. So this renders the intersubjective element of empathy very and highly dubious. Then we have a second element, and that is the element of emotional arousal. When we have identified, when we have labeled, when we have recognized what's happening to someone else, we very often react emotionally. So if we realize that someone is sad or depressed, we become sad and depressed. If we realize that someone is happy, we may become happy, or be, be happy for them for being happy, and so on and so forth. So we have an emotional arousal. We have emotional reaction component 
Now, emotion, the emotional reaction component is, in all probability, innate, in all probability learned, because we know, for instance, that infants smile at their mothers, and we know that uh, children between the ages of four and six display similar behaviors. They are sad when others around them are sad, and they're happy when others around them are happy, and, and so on. That's probably an innate thing. The intersubjective agreement, the aforementioned part, which is, as I said, depends on a common dictionary which cannot be verified, cannot be falsified, cannot be proven. That part is probably learned, probably acquired, and is part of the socialization process. We learn to identify and label things, and uh, we do it uh, almost uh, automatically. Uh, it, Sam, could I just uh, reflect what I'm hearing so yeah. far? You're, you're saying that um, that there's kind of two parts to empathy. There's kind of a uh, a cognitive part and then an emotional part. True. It, it, right. And then that there's also kind of, you, you've heard of debates uh, of whether empathy is innate, that we're born with it, or that we learn it, uh, nature and nurture. So, True. and it could be a combination of both, because I think that's, you know, really... That's my view. The, my view is that it is a combination of both. The intersubjective agreement is learn. And the emotional arousal aspect is innate. The, uh, the, uh, the intersubjective thing is, um, is problematic, as I've just said. We cannot be sure that the other person is said as we are said. It depends heavily on introspection. We attribute to other people what's happening inside ourselves. And this is called projection in psychology. It is actually considered a, a pathological defense mechanism. So there is a pathological element in empathy. <laughs> when I, when I, if, if I, if I, if I were to meet you. Some of these words are, what do you mean by pathological? What, is, what I will, does that I will mean? Explain. If I were to meet you and, and, and I were to watch you and say, Edwin, you, you must be sad. That would have meant that I attribute to you what I know as sadness. Because I cannot access your mind, soul, or psyche. I cannot enter your brain. I cannot ascertain that what you feel as sadness is exactly what I feel as sadness. So I am projecting onto you my introspective experience of sadness. That's the only way. There's no objective lab exam, lab test, which can tell me that your happiness amounts to exactly what I would call happiness. We can't even agree on, the t on, the, on colors. I don't know if what you see as red is what I see as red. Uh -huh. I know that there is a, a frequency of red, light, light wave frequency of red, but I don't know if you experience this frequency the same way that I experience this frequency. So we are locked inside, inside our minds forever. We don't really communicate. The communication is utterly impossible. Wittgenstein, the famous philosopher, um, said that we all have private languages and we pretend that we have a common language known as empathy but it's fake it's utterly fake what we do is we project our own experiences and emotions onto each other assuming implicitly that we all share the same pool of experiences and emotions that, ha well, that hmm. is utterly unprovable proposition well, you had mentioned the kind of the emotional and effective uh, empathy, and as I understand it, that's that kind of happens through mirror neurons. So as we as we uh, do an action or see an action, we have uh, the same uh, neurons uh, firing in our body. So I'm actually looking at your picture here uh, of you with your uh, hand. Uh, your chin on your hand and you know holding your glasses and according to the mirror neurons is that uh, as I understand it how, how th that works is when I see you having your hand your uh, you know chin on your hand and when I do it myself that the same neurons uh, yeah, that's, fire that's in myself but this is, an, this is an action this is not an emotion empathy empathy is putting yourself in someone else's shoes emotionally actions are actions a robot can a robot can mimic me that that has nothing to do with empathy yeah but there's there's uh there's feelings associated with that when you're kind of with the 
the position, you know, the hand, the arm. Really? How do you know what I felt when? How do you know what I felt when this photograph was taken? Um, well, I know I'm doing it myself right you now, don't. kind of. The mimic. answer is that you do not. Anything else you say is pretension. The, you do not know what went through my head, how I was feeling at the time the, the photograph was taken. You can assume, you can presuppose, or suppose, you can speculate. You cannot know. Moreover, even if you uh, do speculate correctly, for instance, you say you were sad. Sam, I think you were sad when the photograph was taken. And I confirm to you that I, and I want to confirm to you that I was sad. Still, we don't know that what you define and experience as sadness is what I define and experience as sadness. My sadness is not necessarily your sadness. In all probability, it is not. Yeah, well, so, it, it seems like the, the mirroring, I mean, you're familiar with mirror neurons and the kind of the, the research behind that where um, it's, that, it's kind of like that we kind of simulate the other person, you know, within ourselves through, you know, through the, mir through the, the mirroring of, of motor, you know, actions. Edwin, there is right? no objective way to prove that what I feel is what you feel. There is no way known to humanity right now, maybe in 2,000 years. Right now, there is no way to prove that what I feel as sadness is what you feel as sadness. And no amount of words and mimicry and gimmickry will change this fact. It's a fact. You, right. When you are happy and I am happy, we, there is no way to prove that my happiness is your happiness or vice versa. We, I label my emotion happiness Having, having experienced introspection, looking inwards, I label my emotion happiness. You look inwards and label your emotion happiness, and we have no way on earth to know that what you experience as happiness is what I experience as happiness. Well, how about the uh, studies about, um, you know, with pain, where they do these fMRI studies where, you know, they, they have that's a very one old, person... That's a very old hat. It's a debate that's been going on since the 17th century. It's known as dualism. Whether, whether physical or physiological phenomena associated invariably with reports of emotions actually are these emotions. In other words, if, I, if people report pain and at the same time there's a certain fMRI phenomenon, and this fMRI phenomenon occurs all the time together with, with pain, can we say that what we are seeing on, in the fMRI uh, uh, picture is the pain? Can we say that it causes the pain? Or is it caused by pain? Or, or is it completely... So we say, we say in uh, philosophy that correlation is not causation. We can correlate phenomena, but we have no idea what's happening. What's happening. We, we cannot link them uh, in a meaningful way. So, whenever there's pain, yes, there is there are some biochemical and electrical and and magnetic changes in the brain. So what? Well, I don't the, know how the, the, the I don't idea, know how the, these yeah. I don't know how these phenomena are connected to pain. I don't know if they cause the pain, are caused by the pain, or how they are linked to, to the pain at all. And I don't know if my pain, if the way I experience and feel pain, is the way you experience and feel pain even if we have the same magnetic phenomena in the brain. Yeah, you're talking about like 100% uh, the sameness, right? I mean, there's, you can have not like a general... Give me 10%, I would be happy. not 100 <laughs> Well, it's like, like you, you've heard this, uh, the studies in, in uh, you know, in Parma, Italy, where they had actual, you know, a specific, uh, a specific uh, neuron wired, you know, electronic, with electrodes or whatever, where when that neuron fired, it was a motor neuron, when that neuron fired, it set off a, uh, you know, a sound that they could know whenever Edwin, that... Edwin, you're confusing then, two issues and we are, we are running in circles, I'm afraid. We're beginning to repeat ourselves. You're confusing... The first issue you're confusing is between physical phenomena, objective physical phenomena, which happen and are reported by people to cause certain feelings, emotions, and so on. The, we have no way of proving that these physical phenomena 
that happen together with the pain, for instance, or together with the happiness, or together with the hunger, or together with whatever. We have no way of proving that these physical phenomena cause these emotions, are caused by these emotions, or are anyhow linked to these emotions. We just know that they co-occur. That's all we know at this stage. There's, no, uh, there's nothing else we can say with certainty about it, any of this. The second confusion is that you are talking, when you are using the word pain, and I am using the word pain, when you are using the word hunger, and I am using the word hunger, when you are using the word happiness, and I am using the word happiness, we have no way of proving that you and I exper are experiencing the same things. Because I have no access to your mind, and you have no access to my mind. And all minds are completely distinct. It's as simple as that. I don't yeah, think, I don't I think, think anyone would argue with it. I don't know how you feel hunger. I don't know what you hunger for. I don't know how you feel hunger. I don't know what's going on in your mind when you feel hunger, and so on. And you don't know anything about me. We are using the word hunger to describe a, an agreement regarding a certain emotion. But this agreement is non-verifiable, non-falsifiable, and not objective by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, well, the, that is I, my understanding with the uh, mere neurons is that there is, you know, you can kind of test what's going on with the individual neurons in our brain, and you can see, you know, how they're firing and, and see kind of similarities. I, I the, uh, you know, if, uh, if the, the, you know, the macaque monkey that they were using, whenever it raised its arm, you know, or reach, actually it was kind of reaching for, um, you know, whatever it was reaching for, to hear different stories about what it was reaching for, it would fire a, a, a neuron, a motor neuron. And um, that when the monkey saw someone uh, reaching for the peanut, or let's say it's the peanut, and when they reached for it themselves, that same neuron fired. So this shows kind of like a, kind of a simulation that we have inside of ourselves that the, uh, the same neuron is firing and that's kind of been extended to uh, humans as well, as I understand. So I see that as kind of like, I mean, that's kind of like the, the, uh, the kind of the main, you know, grounding, I think of, you know, mirror neurons and, you know, emp how empathy works at kind of maybe the affective uh, level. Next question. Okay, well, <laughs> then, uh, well, um, let's see. The next thing would be is, you know, one thing I like to do is look at uh, metaphor. Like, uh, you know, empathy is often described as standing in someone else's shoes and looking through someone else's eyes. Yeah. And for me, empathy is like a cornucopia in the sense that, you know, it, uh, it creates kind of this richness of experience, just like a cornucopia, you know, the horn of plenty that uh, is the Norse legend. I was wondering, do you have a, a metaphor for those two types of uh, empathy that you talked about? You know, the kind of the cognitive and the emotional affective. Well, combat, cold empathy is like uh, uh, a library. It's like mm. a cl classifying, like a labeling, classifying the Dewey system, the Dewey method of the Dewey system of emotions. We we uh, watch them. We make certain assumptions, then we classify them, we label them, put them on the shelf. That's the cold element, the cold component. The emotional arousal part, there is a debate. There is a psychologist, there was a psychologist by the name of Carl Rogers. He thought that we react emotionally to what we see in other people uh, because we have been taught to react that way, we, he believes that uh, he believed, for instance, that we would not we would not uh, inflict pain on someone else, because then we would feel guilty. So it's not that we empathize with that person. Carl Rogers, Carl Rogers says that yes, he says that it's not that we empathize with this person. It's just that we want to avoid pain in ourselves. We want to we want to avoid pain, the pain of feeling guilty, and feeling uh, blameworthy. So that's why we don't hurt other people, not because we empathize with them, not because we understand them, not because we, you know, but because we, it's a, it's a, it's a selfish thing. Uh -huh. so that's, one, that's one approach. Uh, 
another, uh, I would say that emotional arousal is is mirroring, indeed. I think uh, emotional arousal is, mir- is mirror, and the intersubjective part is a library. Okay, well, that's a great uh, metaphor, really. That's, that, that's, uh, I hadn't thought of that library part. So, you know, from what I've been hearing about, um, about psychopathy, is that uh, people who are psychopaths have the, um, the library way of, of seeing the world, and, but don't have the mirroring part. Is that, does that resonate yes, with what yes, your experience is? Yes, that's absolutely true. Narcissists and, and uh, psychopaths, the two mental health disorders that are characterized by uh, the absence of empathy, actually, it's not true to say that narcissists and... Uh, the, the current orthodoxy is that narcissists and psychopaths do not have empathy at all. In my view, that is completely wrong. I think both narcissists and psychopaths are actually hypersensitive, hyperintuitive, and they perceive other people uh, uh, very deeply and very thoroughly. And therefore, I think they have what, what, I, what I call called empathy. They have the library function. They are able to, to watch a person and then catalog that person, dissect, bis- bisect, and catalog the person, and uh, classify the person's emotions and so on and so forth. So th- they do have called empathy. What they don't have is the emotional complement. They, they are not aroused emotionally by someone else's plight, by someone else's predicament, by someone else's emotions, uh, social, uh, facial cues, body language. They, have, they lack the emotional arousal component. Yes, you're right. That, that's, in my view, that's the way it is. Okay, and that's, that's your experience. I mean, as a person that's been diagnosed with, with psychopathy, that you're kind of like a, an embodiment of that, would you say? I mean, you're kind of living that experience. Yeah, I've, done, I've been diagnosed with a borderline condition, psych- oh, okay. psychopathic narcissism. I'm, I'm not a full-fledged psychopath, but uh, yes, I, I do experience it this way. I see someone, I size, size that person up, I analyze uh, the person's... I, I'm, I'm mainly interested in the person's vulnerabilities in the chinks in the person's armor, in how to penetrate, in how to manipulate via intimate resonance with the person's emotions, and so on. So I'm more interested in, in the utilitarian side of getting to know the person intimately than in the person himself. And uh, I definitely do not, have, do not have any trace of emotional arousal, emotional resonance, emotional recognition, uh, let alone uh, the sympathy that is implied in, implied in the term empathy. I, I have none of this. Uh-huh. But to, as far as I'm concerned, people are instruments of gratification, extensions of myself, tools or venues to obtain benefits and, and so on. And so... I need to learn, I need, the, I need the user manual. I need to learn how to manipulate a given person to obtain the given utility that I believe that person can grant me. I garner utility by getting to know people. People are what, I call, what is called the sources of narcissistic supply in the discipline of psychology. Narcissistic supply is, is the fuel. I'm, I'm a drug addict, a junkie, and I consume narcissistic supply which in narcissistic supply is actually attention. So I consume narcissistic supply from people in order to regulate my sense of self-worth and, and uh, my grandiose fantasies. Now, to, to ec- extract narcissistic supply from people, to force them to pay attention to me in a positive or a negative way, I have to learn how to manipulate them. I have to learn what makes them tick. And then I have to make them tick. I do not think that this would be possible without a modicum of empathy. To recognize what makes people think, uh, tick, one needs to know, one needs to, to empathize with these people, but in a cold way. Yeah. As a librarian would with, uh, I don't know, books or digital records. Not in a hot, not in a warm, emotional way. Emotions are, have no utility for me. That's why I don't use them. Yeah, so it's like 
well, there's a couple of things here. One is, what is the difference uh, between narcissism and psychopathy? Um, I, I'm, for me, it's kind of, kind of experientially, I'm, I'm kind of unclear about that. Yeah, well, uh, you're right to be unclear about that. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Committee, which is right now writing the next version of the DSM, also thinks the distinction is unclear. <laughs> oh, okay. And they, are, uh -huh. they are contemplating to abolish it. So uh, I would say that the psychopath is an extreme form of narcissist, where the narcissist lacks empathy to a certain degree, the psychopath lacks empathy completely, where the narcissist is more restrained as far as antisocial activities uh, and behaviors are concerned. The psychopath is utterly unconstrained, and so on and so forth. So it's like an extreme form of narcissist. Oh, okay. So kind of what I'm hearing here about the, the psychopathy is that you're wanting to kind of delve into the experience of someone else and, and you're trying to kind of extract something from them. Mm -hmm. And what is, the, what is it that, that you want to extract? What is it you want to, to kind of gain through the psych, you know, fr fr from, from or, the other? No. Well, it depends. Narcissists want to extract something called narcissistic supply. Narcissistic supply is a pompous, pompous term for attention. Mm -hmm. Narcissists need attention because it is with this external attention that they regulate their sense of self-worth and support their grandiose fantasies. Psychopaths need material, tangible benefits. Psychopaths usually want money or power, or so they are more... They are more uh, utilitarian in their in their behavior, and they are not so concerned with with attention, adulation, admiration. They don't really. They are not really after that. The narcissist is more concerned with his the narcissist is, is a bit um, hermetically enclosed in his universe. The narcissist has this image of himself as omnipotent, omniscient, perfect, brilliant, and he needs people to tell him all the time, "Yes, you are brilliant. Yes, you are perfect. Yes, you are omniscient and omnipotent, and so on." So he needs to force people to tell him that, to confirm to him, to affirm, to support, to buttress his totally unrealistic self-image. Um, and so what he does, he, he converts people, he coerces them into becoming sources of narcissistic supply. And to do that, he needs to understand people. If you don't understand people, if I as a narcissist was unable, utterly unable to understand people, I would not be able to convert anyone to my cause. I would not be able to make anyone tell me that I'm brilliant, great, you know, perfect, omniscient, omnipotent. So it is this ability to know people and to convert them to my cause that I, that I call called empathy. Mm. I mm -hmm. need that. If I were a total alien, if I were as a if I were so flawed that I could have been compared to an alien, you know, from, from outer space. I would not have been able to interact with people to the degree that I am. So I must have some modicum of empathy. And s same goes uh, narcissist, a con man, a con artist, a scammer. If, if a scammer or a con artist is utterly unable to understand people, then how can he, ca how can he defraud them? You need to understand people to pull a fast one on them, over them. Yeah, yeah. It, it, for, it kind of feels like there's a sense of control in there. It's like you want to go into, into the psyche, into the being of the other and kind of control uh, kind of their emotions or... Yes, there is an element of body snatching, if you wish. Uh-huh. Yes, of course. The, the narcissists and, and, and psychopaths are control freaks. They are control freaks because they are, their, their life depends on it. If the narcissist, a narcissist who is unable to garner narcissistic supply crumbles, disintegrates, because he can no longer support his self-image and, you know, he, he falls apart. So it's a life and death situation. I need to be able to control my sources of supply. But, the, but we are discussing empathy, not control, and not narcissism. So the only way I can, uh, the only way I can make people do what I want is by understanding them. If I do not understand people, how can I make them do what I want? Yeah. And the same so, with the psychopath. 
I, I gave you an example of a fraudster, someone like Bernie Madoff. You know, if if Bernie Madoff had no inkling of what it is to be human, if he had, if he was utterly devoid of empathy, how was he able to how was he able to con hundreds of people? He must have some resonance with humanity. He must have a modicum of empathy in in order to be able to manipulate people to do his bidding. And this modicum of empathy is what I call cold empathy. Right. Because he has no emotions, evidently. So he did what he did. He's a totally unemotional person. So there's no emotional element, but there is definitely a cognitive element of empathy in the narcissist and in the psychopath. And that's where the... I think the diagnostic and statistical manual is mistaken. Uh huh. Yeah. So they're it, it's like they're go, they're like in the library and they're they're seeing they're seeing everyone is just a kind of a cold book that t- to be organized and mm-hmm. and moved yeah. around. Yes, it's like a text. Uh-huh. Everyone is like a text, but if you are if you are deprived of reading skills, you cannot read text. What the diagnostic and statistical manual says is that narcissists and psychopaths are illiterate. They cannot read texts. I don't think so. I think narcissists and psychopaths can read these books, can read people, but they don't care. They have no emotional response. Yeah. Well, you know, what I'm looking at is how do we build the culture of empathy, and that's why I'm so interested in, in these, in, in psychopathy and narcissism, because I always see... Uh, you know, the, in, uh, in the articles, in the books, they talk about, you know, empathy, I mean, it's like narcissism and psychopathy, you know, lack of empathy. So, um, you know, to really kind of understand what's going on with, with that and then to see how do we go about creating a culture of empathy? Is it, uh, I mean, you've talked about like, you know, psychopaths being aliens. It kind of sounds like it's a hopeless cause. Um, it, are there ways that we can, you know, promote empathy uh, within this this community? Is it empathy with you mean empathy with psychopaths and narcissists? Psychopaths, yeah. How do we build a culture of empathy? You know, with these people, with narcissists and psychopaths. Yeah. No, that, that's a hopeless case. That's a hopeless case because they are structure, structurally defective. These people, narcissists and psychopaths, are are beyond uh, redemption, if you wish, as far as empathy goes. You cannot generate in them emotional arousal because their emotional apparatus, their equipment, has been damaged beyond repair at a very, very early stage. So there's nothing you can do about it. What you can do is you can teach them, you can modify their behaviors, their antisocial behaviors, uh, to the extent that they don't cause damage or to limit, damage damage limitation or something, Mm -hmm. damage control. But you cannot do much to, to alter them, to change them. They are beyond, beyond uh, beyond developing empathy skills. Well, you were more, saying more, that... Oh. Moreover, if you, if you allow me one oh, more sure. second, mm-hmm. moreover, I think that, um, many many scholars and, and public intellectuals such as uh, Christopher Lash and Theodore Millen and, and others say that society at large, especially Western society, but not only Western society, at large, is becoming more and more narcissistic and psychopathic. And so the narcissist and the psychopath have no incentive to change. Society is adapting itself to their value, to their values, mm. to their scale of lack of emotion and so on. Why change? I mean, it pays to be a narcissist and a psychopath in modern Western society. It's a, it's a winning adaptive proposition. Yeah, so for example, when businesses say the soul... Now, the sole uh, value of business is to make more money. It's kind of like, it's like promoting psychopathic kind of values and way exactly. of being. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Uh-huh. There, there are studies by, um, by uh, Hare and others, who, who these people, dem- these psychologists demonstrated that the business environment nowadays is utterly psychopathic. So yes, and in in the financial industry, in in business at large, in the army in foreign affairs, and you name it. I mean, the whole thing is becoming more, the, all of human society, human culture is, is uh, at least the Western part. But I think the East is fast closing the gap. I think the East is becoming more and more Westernized. Mm-hmm. We, have, we have succeeded, <laughs> quote unquote, we have succeeded to develop a, an utterly narcissistic and bordering on psychopathic uh, realm, uh, mm-hmm. 
civilization. So psychopaths and narcissists are incentivized not only to continue with their misconduct and so on and so forth, but to develop it into, a, into an art form. Yeah, because they have societal support in a sense. Yeah. yeah. Societal support and, you know, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, you did mention, you said that this happened at an early age and then it's kind of like, you know, it's been, you know, uh, it's been developed in the psychopaths and the narcissists from an early age. But that kind of implies that there was a time, you know, if society was supporting a culture of empathy, that a lot of the psychopathy and the narcissism could be headed off at an early age by supporting empathy training, perhaps, and, and you know, a cultural, a cultural value of empathy, you know, from an early age. Yes. Well, um at least as, narciss as far as narcissists are concerned, that would be true. Uh, psychopaths are a different story because there have been numerous studies demonstrating that psychopaths have... Uh... See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. 